Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Such a pleasure uh, to be here and, and to have uh, been on the, what we've called the Rolling Stone Tour. Uh, and about, I think it's the 12th city or maybe the 13th, but we've, um, we've had such warm welcomes and, and the alumni are still very sky high in their enthusiasm for their college and it's just wonderful to be part of that. So uh, I want to thank uh, KP and the staff for organizing things so well, for the host committee, for all you did to put it together, and obviously all of you for turning out. What a nice thing to do. I think we need to appreciate the fact that on July 2nd, when the governance changed, the only thing remaining to be done to close the college, frankly, was turn out the lights. I think we, 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 we almost gloss over that because we think, well, we, we finally got control, we were able to get students and do things, but in between, we came so close to the closing that it's, it's uh, almost scary to think about it. We have gotten a lot accomplished. In 30 days, we were ready to open school. Now, I, I gotta tell you, that's pretty incredible when you think about where we started. To get accreditation, membership in NCAA, get students, get faculty, get the security thing straightened out, get classes scheduled, and we opened seamlessly, I mean flawlessly, on schedule. And we told the students we would teach the things they needed to graduate on time. Now, how are we able to do that? Frankly, we've worked hard, but the real reason is because of what you've done. You're raising the money through saving Sweetbriar and, and the general, general uh, philanthropy that you've, you've participated in made it possible. This college could not have been saved by me. I, I was too late. I would have, July 2nd was too late to save the college. You saved it between March and the end of June when the settlement was reached by contributions and the tenacity. I mean, I keep, I've told a couple of you doing the cocktail hour, I'm still looking for the first wilting flower that ever went to Sweetbriar. <laughs> I, I, I just can't imagine how you, uh, how you could step forward the way you do and assert such leadership. And the young women there at the college are still doing it. I mean, it's just incredible how they're doing it. It's just part of the DNA of the Sweetbriar student and graduate. So you saved your college. And I, had, I alluded to the fact that I chaired the accrediting association for 11 states. Now we accredit UVA, uh, University of Alabama, University of Texas, little community colleges, Bible colleges. You have to be accredited. And I got to see the financial reports of a lot of colleges. And in fact, I sat in judgment on a good number that I had to close uh, because they just didn't have resources usually or some other reason. And one of the questions I was asked when I, I got a call from a friend that got me into this saying, are you surprised that Sweet Bar is closing? And I said, oh, shocked. And he said, was there anything on the radar in the accrediting commission that we just didn't know about? Never, nothing. Sweet Bar was gold. In 2011, re-accredited without a blemish. No citations. So he said, uh, can, you, can it be saved? I said, of course it can be saved. The endowment is still larger than most private colleges. So here's what we faced, I think, in terms of, of the daunting challenges. The outgoing administration was not malignant. Honestly, they were not. I don't, I don't find any evidence of Disneyland or anything in their plans. Uh, but I do think the demographics overwhelmed them. And, and frankly, every small liberal arts college, is a college, unless it is rich, I mean like a half billion and more in endowment, is, is facing these challenges. How do you get enough students and how do you raise enough resources? And uh, a school I had attended, uh, that I'd been president of for 16 years, we doubled in size, we had balanced budgets every year, we never spent more than 5% of the endowment, and we never had an endowment as big as Sweetbriars. So why would you just assume that these demographics require you to close? And uh, so I think, I think it's, it's kind of a, almost a metaphor for life. I mean, in our personal lives, in our family lives, in our businesses, we're, we're confronted with a lot of challenges, always. Nobody's immune, always confronted with challenges. We can either lie down in the road and let the truck run over us, or we can say, no, I have to keep going. I have to do what's necessary to overcome those challenges. And so what we want to do is to overcome those challenges. We will prove we can do it. So let me just tell you what's been done. We opened school flawlessly. The Sweetbriar women were not satisfied to send us all that money, 12 million already in cash and more in pledges, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to do some more. 
Uh, but then you said dozens of us want to come to the campus to prune, weed, polish, paint, and wash windows, and all the hard work it takes to make the campus glisten for the opening of school. I got to tell you, I was not amused by that. I, I thought this is going to be a mess. Women coming from all over the country, not organized, and it's just, but okay, they want to be here, we'll have it like a reunion. And my goodness was I shocked. You came in, you were organized like Patton's army, <laughs> you, and said, you go here, and you go there, and you paint, and you, you weed, and you do this, and you do that, and everybody said, yes, 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 I'll do that. So I went out to the flower garden one day, and the woman was out there in the humidity, hot, dirty, and sweaty, and I said, where are you from? She said, New Mexico. I said, you came in from New Mexico to do this? She said, yeah. Two weeks of vacation I'm taking to do this. I said, what's your day job? She said, I'm professor of medicine in a medical school. So I said, you're the most expensive weed puller I ever met. But <laughs> And in the Sweetbriar House, that was about the time we got access to the Sweetbriar House, and we had these little post-its stuck all over the house. Some of you put them there, too. In the freezer, in the refrigerator, on the floor, on the mirrors, in the restroom. I mean, there was not a place you could go in the Sweetbriar House where you didn't say, welcome, President Mrs. Stone, or we're glad you're here, or we're glad to work for you, or we hope, uh, we hope we can help you, that kind of thing. Just incredible. I saved them all. They're in a little stack. And... Uh, so we got that done. And then we opened school. Open school on time, as I said, flawlessly. We had the academic convocation. We had the academic robes on and everything. We had the largest crowd, according to the faculty members who've been there a long time, ever, ever, for the opening convocation. Historically, the upper class people didn't think it was important to go. And a lot of faculty might not show up. This year, every faculty member showed, every student showed, and we packed the house. And um, I thought that since I was the only stranger in the room, I probably ought to introduce myself. And I said, I'm Phil Stone, I'm your president, and I got a standing ovation. I said, boy, if I say something important, no telling what they'll do. I mean, really. <laughs> but the atmosphere was so electric. Three faculty members talked about what it was like to be there in March when they were last together. I mean, this was the first time they were together again. When they were last together, and they were crying and, and so sad, and how celebrating, how celebrative they were, that everything was now. And uh, the atmosphere, I've called it electric, it really was. People milled around afterwards for a long time, just soaking up the, the feelings they were having. I've had faculty members say, a lot of them say, I've never had so much fun teaching. We're supposed to be in crisis. You know, we're, everybody's supposed to be worried about us. I mean, we're not supposed to be having a good time. We're not supposed to be smiling. I did say to the, fact, to the whole community when I got there, we're going to respect every person. We're going to acknowledge the value of every person's contribution to the college, whether you're cleaning the, the restrooms or cooking or teaching or being present. Everybody matters, and we're going to acknowledge everybody. And we're going to be kind to each other, and we're going to respect differences of opinion and different kinds of people. And, and when, we, when I said that, I, I, I meant it that we would be a, a kind, loving community. That's a sweet briar value. I know it from being with you. That's a sweet briar value. So I think uh, as we got the uh, academic convocation behind us and we're hearing faculty saying they're loving it, the next thing I worried about was would it feel like we were half open because we had a small enrollment? Uh, the Benjamins are here tonight. They have a daughter who's the best writer uh, in the conference, so that conference. Okay, okay look. I second that. Yeah, yeah, you uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> got it. <laughs> She is. She's writer of the year, and she's fabulous and a great student, too. And, and these students will tell you that it does not feel half open. we got a couple of dorms closed, but that gives us a chance to refurbish them and clean them up and everything. And, uh, but we, we had uh, the good food service change, and so now we get rave reviews about uh, food. That sure is a change, I can tell you that. And uh, faculty members are saying they love teaching. The students are getting what they need to graduate on time. Uh, I have been to field hockey games and practices, soccer games and practices. You know, it's a little different for the, at a school like Sweetbriar. When I go to the practice there, they stop the whole thing and have their picture made with me. <laughs> and in all my years at Bridgewater, I never had the football team do that. <laughs> but, uh, or to go to the dance recitals, or see the Twelfth Night, they did the Shakespearean play. Uh, and, and to get the little notes afterwards saying thank you for coming to watch to see us. I mean, the, the comfort. 
Uh, some of you know I moved my office from a second floor of Fletcher down to ground floor because uh, we have no elevator and some people have trouble steps. But also, I thought the students would think I was trying to hide because there's not even a sign to the president's office. I had to ask where it was. They said, go to Fletcher, second floor. And I said, where? I don't see a sign. So when you get up there, it'll, it's identified. You can, when you're up there, you can find it and you know where you are, then it's a sign. But um, so I said, I don't want students to think I'm, I'm inaccessible. Uh, I want them to come by if they need me, and if I'm not tied up, I will see them. No appointment needed. So the benefit to me was that I didn't realize at the time was that there's a, a lot of glass on the right-hand side as I'm working at my computer, looking out over the parking lot, and I would see students coming by. You can see it very clearly, and so I could wave, and they'd wave back. And now the students will sometimes pause right there until they get my attention. <laughs> and they'll, yeah, okay, you can go now, okay. <laughs> And to uh, as staff members here regularly eat with the students. I eat with the students. We love interacting with them. They're fabulous. Uh, I've told several of you tonight that we, we obviously had trouble scheduling games and putting everything back together. We're going to build up the sports program. We want women to have an opportunity to participate in intercollegiate athletics and do well. And we're going to support it so they can be competitive. And, and I think uh, when, when they know that people like our staff folks and the faculty show up for it, we had a tailgating party for the last field hockey game. We had a big tailgating party. And we had the board meeting dismissed early so the board members could come out and support the tailgate. And so the students felt so supported and so, so far. The alumni have arranged for the food trucks to come to campus. We've had taco trucks and donut trucks and grilled cheese trucks and ice cream trucks. Keep them coming. Uh, <laughs> The students really love them, and I go out just to support them. <laughs> I'll tell you how much it changed. Two journalists, you remember, were shot dead in Roanoke a couple months ago. And the, their colleague had interviewed me a couple times at the college uh, from the same station. And he called me and said, the, the day after it occurred, he said, our hearts are breaking. Uh, we have got to keep doing our news, keep doing our stories. I need to do a happy story. Can I come to Sweetbriar? Now think about March 3rd. Who would have come to Sweetbriar to do a happy story? So he came over, I was able to greet him, express our condolences. The ice cream truck was there. <laughs> and I said, do I have a treat for you? <laughs> and so uh, we gave him ice cream and then there were students milling around and faculty. I was able to introduce him and, and I just walked away and let him enter do the interviewing. And he was smiling and laughing and I thought, that's, that's the Sweetbriar you remember. That's, that's, it's a happy place. It's a place where people feel like smiling and laughing. And uh, that's the way we want it to be. No more, of this, no more of these tears and anguish and lamentation. It's a place for happiness. So this is what we've accomplished uh, so far. We got school started. We, we did it well. We, uh, we also got noticed the other day. We're really proud of this. We found out that some, one of our competing schools had actually taken notice that the accrediting association that I once chaired did not put us on probation or warning. Now, a woman's college close to us a few years ago put, got put on warning and they had a bigger endowment, over 100 million. And so they were wondering, why are we not on warning? The board said to you they didn't have enough money to run the college, so how can you miss that? Well, we immediately, I called almost my first day, called the, the person whose chairman I'd served as and said, we're gonna send you information. We'll give you the information about the money we're raising to show you that we got it so we wouldn't get a warning too quickly. And then we had her actually come to campus to speak to the board. She was a great hit. She's a great speaker, Belle Whelan. And she was once, by the way, Secretary of Education in Virginia. And, uh, and I'd been her chairman for three years. So then uh, we continued to send her good information about what we were doing, the budget we just approved, and everything else. The only, the only way you can go on sanction with the crediting association is they send a committee. And they can send it in 24 hours if it's urgent. And so if they send a committee, you don't always enjoy that. Well, you're always glad to see old friends. You don't necessarily want them on your campus because what can come out of that is warning or probation. That's a public sanction. So the world knows that you have another hit. So we got a letter the other day saying, we see no reason to send a committee to Sweetbriar College. Isn't that great news? Yeah. The board just approved a budget that is the most responsible business-like budget in at least 10 years and maybe 25. It balances the budget for the year. It spends 5% of the endowment, which is what good colleges do, because uh, we've been spending a lot more 
up to 14% of the endowment, eating out of the endowment, that's one of the problems. And it hasn't been under 6% for at least 10 years. I haven't researched it before that, but our chief financial officer right now is Tom Connors. Some of you remember when he was there before. He says, I don't think it's ever happened. He said, I don't remember 25 years. So we are, the board has approved a responsible business-like budget. It actually shows a small surplus, 5% of the endowment, and the $16 million that you've read about that the Attorney General will release from endowment restrictions, we don't plan to touch that. I thought we might need to live on it. We don't need to touch it. In addition to that, even though the Attorney General is releasing that, so it, it would, would not be in permanent endowment, the board, at my request, quickly agreed that passed a resolution to say all those endowments will stay like they are. And they would use them for the purpose the donor intended for, and, and continue to keep them in endowment earning money and using them for those purposes. Only the board, only the board can touch it. That is, uh, the management can't build a budget just grabbing money where it can. We have to go to the board and convince them by a super majority vote, 75%, to, to do something. So we think we've protected those a lot to honor the donors. Imagine a donor who set up a, an endowment maybe in memory of a child who died at Sweetbriar. And you go and say, that memory is going to be erased. And we, we didn't want to do that. So we are trying to preserve the integrity of those endowments and those gifts. Now, what we need to do is we need to, we need to get students and we need to get money. That's my mantra, get students, get money. And uh, so we are, we're trying to get the money by coming to you uh, over and over and over, but telling you how much we need. Mary Pope uh, Hudson was introduced already as a board member and is one of your own here. You also probably know by now that she was just named Vice President for Alumni Relations and Development. She's going to be the fundraiser in chief. And I bet she'll have a lot of ideas for you. She was the uh, main spear thrower uh, leader in raising the money for Saving Sweetbriar, so she knows a little bit about this. And uh, we're going to challenge our alumni to raise a lot of money early to get us through these next few years. Even though we have the most business-like budget that, we, that we've ever presented, it's based a lot on the revenue that's coming in as gifts. And it's critical. That's, that's the way we do it. But we're, what we're trying to tell you is we are also trying to use the gifts that come into us responsibly to make it part of a business plan that gets us to the, where we need to be, not just spending it and, and saying we need some more. And so what we need to be doing while that money is being raised is we need to build the enrollment. And when we have a freshman class that's under 40, that goes through the system all four years. So even though we bring in big classes from now on, you can imagine the total enrollment will still not grow so fast because we're about 180 students under what we ought to be for that class, or at least 160. Now, what are we going to do to, to do that? We need to get to 800 students, we want to do it quickly. We want to get to 800 because we don't have to build anything for 800 students. We have enough capacity for 800. We've never been there, but we, we need to get there. It costs us very little to add uh, students when you don't have to build things. We've got a great faculty, but we've got classroom capacity. The food service, the most expensive meals we'll ever serve will be the first 240. Everything you add after that is marginally very small. Uh, we, have, uh, you know, we have enough space for students too, don't you think, with 3,200 acres? So we, we know that with very little cost, we can add students and we want to get there in, in the next four or five years to get to 800. At that point, uh, whoever is president ought to be looking at uh, what we do to get to 1,200. And frankly, uh, ultimately, we ought to be looking at 1,800. 1,800 is still a small school, not the way you knew it, but it is a small school and, and it lets us flourish. It lets us really have energy and capacity to, to be strong without having to come to you every year with heroic giving requests. We can have a more standard, traditional development plan. So that's the plan. Get the money from you as early as we can to help get us through these lean years of enrollment and immediately start building that enrollment. How do we do that? One is uh, we're going to try to make the case better. We know that some people already listen to the case and they just don't come. So we want to talk to that group more effectively. Well, how do you 
do it more effectively. One thing you say is, have you seen what the women of Sweet Bride just did? You think that doesn't show leadership? Don't you want to be part of that? I mean, let's, let's get real now. That's where leadership really is. It's unprecedented. I said earlier that I, liked, I got to see a lot of records of other colleges. There's no precedent for this. There's precedent for colleges uh, coming back to life, usually in a different form. There's precedent for colleges being saved because they do special things. They become a multi-purpose university. They become co-ed, whatever it is. But for women to step, for anybody, any, any alumni, to step up and say, I save my college as it is. That is, the soul of the college will be preserved. That's unprecedented. It's incredible, frankly. The legal theory that the lawyer started out with was a long shot. It shouldn't have worked. It did. You should not have been able to raise $30 million in pledges. You did it anyway. You should not have converted 12 million of it to cash in 100 days. You're not supposed to be able to raise money, remember? <laughs> and you did it anyway. And you're not supposed to have that, that enthusiasm that makes you come out and work your heart out for this college doing dirty work even on the campus, coming out to these events on a weeknight when you're busy, and, and supporting your college. But you did it. And what we need to have our prospective students understand is something special happens at Sweetbriar. And, and we need to better articulate that, but it makes you bond in a special way with that college. You still have the same feeling that you had when you first came on that campus about its beauty, how it appeals to you. It's, when I talk about Sweet Bra having a soul, you know what I'm talking about. The creativity, the mystique, the beauty, uh, all the things, putting together a physics major with dancing. Who ever heard of that? <laughs> and it's done at Sweet Bra. And people ride horses, but then go into engineering. I mean, just all kinds of things that are just normal at Sweetbriar. The funny little uh, gowns they wear with all these stickers on them and everything, and I've tried to figure out what they mean. The uh, sweet tones, uh, step singing. I mean, I'm learning it all, and, and it's fabulous. The, the, the wonder of that place. And that's one of the reasons I think we're all brokenhearted. Could you imagine it not being used? All that beauty. So what we want to do is to bake the case better. One of the things that we, catch our, we need to catch ourselves about is that when we say to young women who are about to graduate from high school or maybe juniors and sophomores even, that you ought to look at Sweetbriar, we tend to say about small colleges, you come to us as like summer camp, we hold your hand, we don't let you fall, and if you fall down, we'll put a Band-Aid on it. And, and the girls are saying, are you kidding me? I'm grown up, I don't want that. Parents say, I like it a lot, but the girls don't like it that much. What we need to be saying, because it's true, is do you have what it takes to sit in a class of five to 15 with a scholar professor who's probably written books where your lack of preparation is known in two minutes, <laughs> where you can't put your head down on the desk and sleep, you can't talk about Saturday's football game, you can't miss class because you'll catch up and make a, a ladies or gentlemen see on the exam, somebody will come find you. You are going to be engaged as a serious young scholar at 18 years of age. Do you have what it takes? Not, do you need to be coddled? And I think we need to catch ourselves in the way we say these things. I think we need to say, do you have what it takes to be a sweet brow woman? If you don't, if you want to sit in a class and put your head down and sleep, not prepare, buy the book the night before the exam, get a ladies or gentlemen see, sweet brow's not for you. We admit it. It's not for you. We want grown-ups. And we need to make that case better. The other thing we need to do is we need to, uh, we need to get more international students. Uh, Bryn Mawr uh, and, and, and uh, some of the other schools, Mount Holyoke, they have up to 20, 25 percent international students. Hadn't heard them much. Pretty good schools. We need to have a better international presence. We've had a better international presence. We have one half of one percent right now. So we need to do a better job of that. We also will focus, I want us to, to be thinking, and it's starting to gel for me, but I want to test it with a lot of other people, you and, and staff and others. We, we want to we make sure that we are interpreted properly. The, the, the caricature that has stuck around a lot for women's colleges, particularly Sweetbriar with our beautiful campus and the riding program, is ride, women who ride but don't, aren't, you know, aren't going to take any serious courses or something like that, aren't going to be scientists or whatever. And it's never been true, but it's part of the, the image sometimes of, of women's colleges. Uh, what we find is that women's colleges, including Sweetbriar, produce a disproportionate number of leaders in every field they go into. If you start looking at your numbers from women's colleges, you produce the leadership out of proportion to your numbers. 
We also have an engineering program. That makes quite a statement immediately about any image that people have about not being serious. And uh, even though the other uh, disciplines do it just as well. And then, then I think we need to say that we want to, we want to have people remember that there are still glass ceilings in our culture. And that if women are going to be in leadership in engineering and all kinds of things where they've been underrepresented historically, it's going to happen at Sweetbriar. Women engineers, and we go to people like Exxon and engineering companies and others and say, are you embarrassed that you don't have enough women scientists and engineers? We, we grow them. How about some scholarships? How about some internships? How about some jobs? And, and have us become known as the place where women's, women leadership is developed in all fields. And if we can make that an international image, this is the place for international development of women in leadership, we will have really resurrected the true soul of Sweetbriar, it seems to me, and applied it in a new generation and in a way that's exciting enough that I'd like to think young women would find it interesting and attractive to come to. Now let me close before I turn to your questions uh, to see, to tell you the, the, uh, an incident that means a lot to me. I've, I've been so impressed with what you did and, and I learned to love Sweetbriar very quickly. When I was asked to do this, I did not know much about women's education. My school was the oldest co-educational college in Virginia. So I used to brag, we're the oldest co-educational college in Virginia. But it also started in 1880 with women being given a fair chance at a time when women did not have fair chances. And so when Sweetbriar started in 1901, that was still the case, and women's colleges were needed as an additional place where women could be educated. Our school happened to be a, a, a very rare instance of men and women going to school together. But I've, I've come to appreciate not only Sweetbriar and, and, and what it means in terms of liberal, uh, uh, women's education, but I deeply believe in liberal arts. I really believe in residential liberal arts education. It seems to me that it's been tested and tried as old as the Greek ideal of the, of the integrated mind, body, and spirit. We should never get away from it. It serves us forever. It helps us remind us who we are, what our, what our nature is, what our social relationships are, what our political systems are, what our culture is, how do we express ourselves as human beings. And without that, we become almost like uh, kind of a mixture of high-level animals and robots. I mean, I just, I just think we lose our humanity. We've got to fight for it. And that's what appealed to me when I was asked to do this, save the college, save Sweetbriar. But I'm falling in love with Sweetbriar. It is, it is easy to love Sweetbriar, and I love that. I wanted to commemorate what you did. And so in, uh, in preparation for Founders Day, which I knew would be a special time for us, uh, I uh, did something that was a little bit uh, risky because I inscribed something on a tombstone. And you don't normally do that um, to tombstones, but uh, I was going to do it anyway. And you remember the angel statue has the plaque underneath, one for Daisy and one on the side for the mother and one on the side for the father. And we laid a rose on each of those three graves as part of our ceremony on the hill after Founders. And then I asked the crowd to move to the back where there's a black uh, tablet. We laid a fourth rose, and then we uncovered the plank, which had just had the inscription put into the marble. And it read, we kept the faith, college saved, vision endures, roses still bloom. And it seems to me, And it seems to me that captures what we're all excited about is that at Sweetbriar College, the roses still bloom. Thank you. I think the most exciting thing of all is what's happened in the last six months. The fact that we have come together as a community in an unprecedented way and saved this institution because it means so much to us um, to move forward for the future. That, that just speaks volumes. Right now, I think Sweetbriar needs to be most proud of all of its traditions being at Sweetbriar still. Tap clubs, chorus, you've got theater going on, you've got the writing program going, you've got snakes on campus being found, homes in Guyon. Sweetbriar is a loving, healthy, happy, nurturing environment without being mothering. It is allowing you to find your own way and your own voice. 
And I think that what they have at Sweet Bar right now is what they had 31 years ago when I went. Well, I'm so proud of the way everything is coming to life again. That's such a wonderful thing. I think Sweet Bar has most to be proud of its alumni. I really feel like the alumni came through when it mattered most. Almost the closure of Sweetbriar has brought us back with a new vengeance and has re-energized the alumni and we almost lost what was so important and precious to us and that that new energy is going to do nothing but help the institution grow and be successful in the future. I think that we are running a campus that has the students happy, that they, all the activities, the sports, the academics, the theater, everything is running and there's such a positive um, atmosphere on campus. I think that is something we should be extremely proud of. I mean, besides the fact that, wow, we saved it, is that, you know, we are, and also that we're running Sweeper or at Sweetbriar, not as some other form of Sweetbriar, but it's a Sweetbriar that we love. I was interested to learn about the enrollment, and that is a goal. Um, I wasn't aware of the numbers, and I think it's really important to know the goal of filling the campus with 800 students. I've actually been working on that, trying to increase enrollment uh, by visiting some of the feeder schools here, the public high schools and the private schools, and giving them a brochure about Sweetbriar and attending an open house in one case. And so that's, that's something I think I can do and I enjoy it very much. I was a school teacher so I always like being around kids.